The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending this morning's webinar, Faster and More Accurate Class in HCA MCA Assessment for Gas Pipelines. I'm Marissa Davis. I'll be facilitating this morning for y'all. In this morning's presentation, this will be the third in our quote unquote social distancing webinar series, and it's perfectly timed with the announcement of our latest software product release. In case you missed it, last week we announced the release of our new gas HCA tool. We're super stoked about that. And today you're going to get to see some of that in action as Tracy takes you through a live demo. At the end of the presentation, um, we hope to have a few minutes to answer any burning questions you may have. So if you have something you want to ask, just go ahead and ask it via the question function and Tracy will be happy to answer that. It is possible though that Tracy gets excited and runs right up to the hour, in which case I'll compile those questions, send them to Tracy and he'll send them out to you. He'll reach out to you directly with that. Um, and let me just say this quick, cause it's happened a couple of times in the past few weeks that before I press the start broadcast button on the webinar, I make sure I close Outlook and everything else that may make a dinging sound. So if you try and send me a question over email, I won't get it until afterwards. So let's just go ahead and use this function here on GoToWebinar so I can get those answered. Uh, we hope that you and your families are safe and healthy and let's get started. The host of today's webinar, G2 Integrated Solutions, provides responsive support and a comprehensive suite of asset integrity, engineering, GIS, field services, regulatory, and software solutions that address asset performance through its life cycle. For more details on our services, please visit our website. And with that, I will introduce you to our presenter, Tracy Thorlifson, as if he needs an introduction. Tracy is our technical authority for GIS here at G2. He leads our software development team. <clears throat> Tracy has oh. an extensive, oh, go ahead. Nope, thank you, go oh. ahead. Tracy has an extensive background in petroleum and pipeline industry data, business process and physical process modeling. He is a founding member of the Pipeline Open Data Standard Organization and has served pods in various roles. In his current role here at G2IS, Tracy leads a diverse team of software developers and GIS specialists, providing technical expertise and managing products or projects and clients in both specialties. And Tracy will take it from here. All right, thank you, Marissa. And yeah, she asked how many years of experience I had the other day, and I, I put it up there, and I realized, yes, I, I guess I really am. I really am that old. On, on the other hand, the, uh, the 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 plus side of it is is that I get to regale my developers with uh, with scary tales of Unix. It's like telling your kids stories about the the boogeyman. Um. Anyways, uh, what we'd like to do today is to uh, introduce the new Gas HCA tool, and uh, and and really um, the changes to the tool that uh, allow us to be in compliance with the new requirements around moderate consequence or MCA determination. Um, that rule was, uh, part one of the rule was published in October of last year, and as probably most of you are keenly aware, it goes into effect on July 1st of, uh, of this year. So we wanted to make sure to, uh, to get that, get that uh, capability built into the gas HCA tool software. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how all that works and what the capabilities of the tool are. Um, we'll, um, and really, we're going to kind of hit uh, hit both the requirements of the regulation and also what that means to you in terms of data and how you process that. So we'll, we'll touch on that quite a bit. Um, we've also made some enhancements to uh, the class location side of the tool, particularly with respect to uh, how we do class four determination. So we'll spend just a little bit about that. And along the way, we're gonna we're gonna hit uh, we're gonna hit. Um, these other topics through here, um, mainly support for ArcGIS Pro. It is actually our primary development platform now, although uh, we will continue to support desktop for the foreseeable future. And we're going to introduce our knowledge center uh, today. Um, this is our, our, our new online help system that basically puts all of the help for our tools online, um, just as Esri does with their tools. And you'll see that we actually follow um, their architecture for doing that. And we'll talk a little bit about support for, for UPDM and, and uh, ArcGIS pipeline referencing and the location referencing information model that's embedded in that. And I'm actually uh, demoing off of local data um, this morning, mainly because I don't want to have any hiccups uh, going over VPN to, uh, 
to hit our system at work. We are actually doing this from home today, so we are social distancing. And last but not least, uh, we've incorporated some uh, new licensing technology in the tools, and that's going to flow through all the rest of our tools as uh, the year progresses. So I wanted to introduce everybody to that and uh, give you a feel for how all of that works. So with that, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, the first thing we need to talk about really uh, with respect to moderate consequence areas is the actual definition. Um, so this is the definition that appears in the, uh, in the Federal Register that was published uh, back in October of uh, 2019. Uh, the actual hyperlink reference is here for you. And uh, so for those of you who download the slides later on, um, you'll be able to go ahead and hit those links and be taken directly to it. Um, but what we see is that for a moderate consequence area, the definition really um, in part mimics very much what we see going on for high consequence areas. Um, so we see the first thing of note here is that is that a moderate consequence area consists of five or more buildings intended for human occupancy or BIHOs as we affectionately refer to them um, that are present within the PIR. Now we're all keenly aware, I think, that uh, that if you have 20 or more structures or an identified site in the PIR, that causes a high consequence area. Um, so what we have here is a gradation. So from five to 19 structures in the uh, in the in the potential impact circle. Um, then that, that gives us a moderate consequence area. Um, but the or here is the, uh, is the operative word. And, and basically the new thing that has been added, and this is response to an incident in Tennessee a couple of years back, is that, uh, is that if you have the portion, any portion of the paved surface of, uh, of a major road inside the PIR, um, that's also going to uh, to cause a moderate consequence area. So freeways, expressways, and and this special term, principal arterial roadways with four more lanes, um, those also will all cause a moderate consequence area if they uh, if they intersect your potential impact radius for your pipeline. And all of this uh, all of this terminology is defined by the Federal Highway Administration, and uh, the link to that document is uh, is also included here. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that plays out in terms of, uh, of, of real data in just a slide or two. Now, the other part of the definition basically deals with extension of moderate consequence areas. And, and so this part two of the definition really mimics exactly um, what we see for part one of the definition. So let's talk about, about this extension business and, uh, and then we'll come back and talk more about roads. So this diagram is actually straight out of uh, straight out of uh, section 192. It's in the appendix, um, appendix E, and and what we've got here in this example is a is a school, which of course would be a identified site, and uh, and the idea here behind it is that as our potential impact circle is 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 working down the line, the first point at which it touches that that school. Um, begin defines the beginning of the high consequence area, and uh, and then it ends at the last point where uh, that potential impact circle touches the school, and then we extend along the line in either direction from that first point and that last point um, by the radius by the potential impact radius um, to extend. Um, that uh, that high consequence area, and so in our terminology here for many years, we've referred to it as uh, as the direct HCA being the portion of the uh, of the HCA that is inside of uh, of that portion where the potential impact circles directly affect the uh, the structure or the identified site, and then the extension pieces being that radial sweep of the PIR um, beyond that point. And it, you know, if you think about it, it, when I get to this point right here, where I'm, I'm at the center of that that circle that last touches the school or first touches the school, you know, anywhere anywhere here within what we're calling this direct HCA, if my potential impact circle was truly a circle, then that would be the last point at which that school would actually be affected. You know, in the case of uh, of, of rupture and ignition. Um, however, you know we know we know from historical experience that when we have a, a guillotine rupture of a of a gas pipeline, um, we tend to get a torch effect if there is ignition, and so our potential impact circle is really not so much as a circle as it is an ellipse directed along the uh, direction of the line, and so this extension of the PIR in either direction accounts for that effect, 
and uh, and gives us a more realistic picture of what would actually be affected in the uh, in the event of a rupture with ignition. Um, but this terminology is important to us because it uh, it's also reflected in terms of the way our software works, and we'll we'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about is road data, and so roads are the the new piece to all of this. You know, for many years we've been capturing structure footprints and doing surveys in the field to confirm what types of structures we're looking at, what the occupancy of those structures are, and so on and so forth, um, with respect to identifying bios and, and identified sites. Um, but now we've got this new thing out there, and, and we have to actually consider um, roads as we're calculating MCAs. And one of the first things that we need to come to grips with is that is that roads are actually generally stored in, in the GIS world in, as polyline data sets. And so you see up over here on the upper right hand side, um, a little diagram of road center lines, right? They're polylines, they have no width. And, and of course the language of the requirement basically says we have to pay attention to the paved width of the roadway. And so what that means for us is that, is that um, in these data sets, whether they're coming from commercial or public data sources, we're going to need to have some kind of attribution that allows us to get to that pavement width. And what we'll do in practice is we'll go ahead and we'll take these polyline features and we'll run a GIS buffer operation. And what that'll do is that'll turn them into polygons where the, where the width across the polygon is actually the, the pavement width of the road. So, so some data sets uh, um, have that information um, in great detail. So this lower picture here is from the, uh, from the Texas Department of Transportation Roadway Inventory data set. This is straight out of their uh, user manual. And so I have information for, for surface width of the roads, including the shoulders and median width. And so I've got, I've got more than enough attribution to get to the actual width of the road. There are other data sets that don't have that. And one of the things that you need to be very keenly aware of is that um, many of the State Department of Transportation data sets don't actually conform to those FHA requirements um, from the Federal, Federal Highway Administration. So um, a good example is the, uh, is the USGS National Transportation data set. This is actually a data set that's part of the national map. And it includes roadway data. It's it's kind of the grandchild of the old Tiger Line files for those of you who are old enough to remember that stuff. And this data set doesn't contain any information at all about road width. So one of the things you may find yourself doing, depending on where you are in the country, is uh, is coming up with some logic to define road width um, based on whatever road classification information you have. And then that kind of takes us to our second point, which is that which is that very few of the State Department of Transportation roadway data sets actually conform um, to that FHA functional classification of roads. Um, some of them do. So, so the TxDOT roadway inventory that we're going to be looking at this morning, it, it does uh, conforms exactly, and it makes it very easy to uh, construct queries to query out just those road features that are appropriate for MCA determination. Um, but some don't. And so what that means is that not only are you going to have to struggle in some cases with road width information, um, you're also going to have to struggle to map whatever road type attribution you have um, to get to something that approximates the, uh, the FHA um, classification. So going forward, you know, one of the other things that's coming out with the MA rule is this requirement to document our processes, right? And, uh, and so that's all going to have to be documented as part of your processes going forward. So enough on data. Let's, uh, let's talk about the software itself and, uh, and a little bit about how it works. So this is ArcGIS Pro for, for those of you who are, are familiar with it. And basically what we've done is we've shipped the Gas HCA tool as a collection of toolboxes for use in the ESRI geoprocessing framework. And uh, we also actually ship along with it a Python module for those of you who are Python developers. And what you'll see here is, is that we actually ship two toolboxes. So we ship a toolbox that we call the master tools. And these are the higher level tools that really your users will interact with or that you'll actually use to, uh, um, to perform analyses. Um, they in turn are, are composed of tools that are from the uh, GAS HCA tools toolbox. And what you'll see there, for those of you who recognize the icon type, is those are all Python toolbox tools. 
So um, basically, by shipping the master tools as a collection of model builder model tools, um, what you can do when you get the software is you can actually go ahead and you can open up those model builder model tools. Um, this is an example of the uh, class location tool, and it's just a model builder model, right? And so that gives you a lot of options in terms of how you actually choose to implement that tool for your users. Um, so um, you can go ahead and you can take this model builder model tool and you can tweak the logic in it. You can add additional logic. Um, you can add or remove uh, parameters that are exposed to the user in the tool. Most of you who are running against uh, enterprise geodatabases will choose to hide the vast majority of, of the parameters that we expose in these tools just to simplify things for your users. Um, so, so by having it in the form of, uh, of, of model builder model tools, it gives you a base for customization and configuration um, so that you don't necessarily have to use the tools directly as we do. You know, we're obviously, we're, we're exposing them in terms of what we think best practices are, but um, we've been doing this for long enough to recognize that, uh, that many of you have slight tweaks on the logic relative to the way that, that we do it. Right. The other thing that this affords you is, is the ability to take full advantage of the Esri Enterprise platform and, uh, and in particular, the full geoprocessing framework in enterprise. Um, so in Pro, you know, for those of you who are familiar with it, I can go ahead and I, you know, after I run a tool, I can set it up to run as a scheduled task. Um, so I can, I can run my, my class location or gas HCA tool as a scheduled task directly from, from ArcGIS Pro. Um, I can also go ahead and I can set up a geoprocessing server. So I'm not even running the tool on my desktop. I'm taking advantage of heavy iron. And furthermore, I can go ahead and, and I, can, I can take one of these tools and I can expose it as a geoprocessing service um, through ArcGIS for server so that now I have a REST endpoint. And if I want to make it available through a web interface as a web app or even on a mobile tool, if I were, if I were that crazy, I could go ahead and, and do those types of things. Um, so by, by, by using the geoprocessing framework, we get an awful lot of, uh, of Lanyap in terms of added power. Uh, with respect to how people actually can use these tools, right? And, and of course, if you want, you can always just run the tools in the desktop and uh, use them just like 90% uh, of uh, users use your processing tools in the, uh, in the industry world. Now, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how the tools actually work. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is an important thing. Um, so if you wanted to do it the hard way, you could go ahead and you could take your potential impact circle and, and these green circles are all of the PIR radius. And of course you can see the PIR buffer on my green center line here. You could take that potential impact circle and you could just march it on down the pipeline at some preset interval, say five or 10 feet. And, uh, and every time you move that circle, you just do a count of how many structures are inside of it. And, and that's actually the hard way to do it, right? And, and not only is it the hard way to do it, it's, it's actually because you have to move that circle in a, in a discrete interval, um, your, your, the resolution of your answer or your result um, is limited by, by the increment at which you move that circle. So we take a little bit of a different approach. What we do is we actually buffer all of the features that we're interested in looking at by the potential impact radius. And then we calculate the intersections of those intersect of those those uh, PIR buffers with the center line. So in this example here, I have a number of uh, of, of uh, structure footprints of, of just for different colors, and uh, there's numbers in them, and those numbers represent the number of dwelling units in those structures. Um, and one of the things that uh, we all need to be aware of is that is that each individual dwelling unit, for the purposes of counting structures that actually counts as an individual by hope, right? And, uh, and so I've got, three, so here's a little quadplex, here's a duplex. I don't know what, the, what three is, maybe that's a garage apartment or something like that, a couple small apartments. Um, but, but the idea is, is, that, is that what we wanna do is we wanna take those, those PIR buffers for our footprints and intersect those with the center line to get these PIR segments. And then we're going to do some dynamic segmentation and aggregation. So um, many of you who use our tools, you're aware that we have a very powerful dynamic segmentation engine, and we actually borrow some of that software in the, uh, in the GAS HCA tool. 
And, uh, and so essentially what we're doing is we self-intersect those segments with each other, and then we aggregate or sum the counts of the dwelling units within them. And so what you see is we're coming along here and we've got zero, and then we hit this first circle, so that gives us four. In, in this area right in here, I'm, this portion of the center line actually, actually affects both of these structures. And, uh, and so we add up the number of, uh, of dwelling units and that gives us 10. So boom, right here, we're directly in MCA territory, right? So back to six, and then we've got a little gap. Um, we hit five, we hit our combo here again. So we're up to seven and uh, then drop back down to two and, and then up to five again, and then back down to three. And, and so what we see then is that, is that we have these, these direct HCA segments where the center line is directly affecting those structures um, or by virtue of the PIR. But remember, we always have to do our extension. So our actual MCA range extends from here um, to here in this, in this particular example. And we've got, of course, some HCA or MCA in this case by extension at either ends. Um, but we're also filling in the gaps by extensions, and we'll obviously see a real life example of that in a uh, in in just a few minutes. So, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and and jump into a demo. Um, that's my cat Fido. Fido Fido helps with both programming and testing, so uh, he's been working pretty hard here lately. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump out of the slideshow, and uh, and we'll go ahead and jump into in this case our JS Pro. So here we are in, uh, in ArcGIS Pro, and, and those of you who have worked with our software and taken our training over the years, you'll, you'll recognize this. This is the, uh, what we call the KD transmission system. Um, we're, of course, based here in Houston, and this is over on the uh, west side of town. Um, the old Eagle offices used to be right here, and so this, this little training data set um, centered on our, on our old offices. And what you see is that is that it covers a, a variety of different territories. We're primarily going to be looking at this one line, the KD transmission line, and uh, it runs west along uh, along I-10, so along this major freeway corridor um, with lots of uh, tall buildings and whatnot. And then it dips off towards uh, towards the southwest into suburbia, right? And if we look at our symbolization here for the layers that we have in the map, what you'll see is that is that I've got um, my structures here um, highlighted in green. And in fact, let me, uh, let's go ahead and zoom into that suburban area and get a better feel. Um, so we've got structure footprints here in green. Uh, they're, they're colored according to the number of stories. Um, and since these guys are primarily uh, single family residences, um, what you'll see is that, uh, is that most of them are these two story homes. We've also got a number of identified sites of, uh, of type A, B, and C, um, again, by color. And, uh, and so you can see here, you know, here's a, uh, here's a type A, it's an outside area of some sort. And, uh, and then we've got the type Bs and the type Cs. And overlaid on top of that, we've selected out just the identified sites that happen to be buildings intended for human occupancy. Um, so that together I get my full building count with, uh, with both my residential structures and um, the type B and C facilities. And I've gone ahead and symbolized those by the number of stories. Um, not of any importance here in terms of doing HCA and MCA calculations, but we're going to come back in a few minutes and look at class location. And of course, when I'm looking at class location, I'm very keenly interested in the, uh, in the number of stories that we're, that we're dealing with. So let's go ahead and, uh, and we'll zoom back out. To our full extent, and uh, what I'm going to do is rather than rather than run the tool directly, I'm going to go ahead and just bring up a saved result, and uh, we'll look at that. And uh, what you'll notice here is that is that uh, we're recording, of course, everything that we do, and because the tools are ex exposed as uh, as toolbox tools, um, we get the same history on them as we would with any other toolbox tool. Now you'll notice that our HCA method two, two run here actually has some uh, actually has some warnings in it, and that's actually on purpose. We're trying to make these tools very data fault tolerant. Um, it's been our experience over the years that uh, that not everybody has what I would call perfect data, and so the idea here is that the tool is going to uh, is going to continue to run, um, but it is going to tell you where you do have data problems. Right? But let's go ahead and pop this guy up and let's see what you actually have to enter to run one of these tools. And so, uh, so we're popping up in this case, our HCA MCA tool for method two. 
and it's initializing with everything that I had filled in the last time I ran it. And uh, what you'll see here is that is that we've got a number of parameters that are designed to capture all of the uh, input data that's required to calculate HCA and MCA. Now, I want to state right off the bat, this course is a model builder model tool. Um, it's going to create a project geo, geo database to store all of your input data as well as your output data. And uh, you could very easily modify the tool so that you don't preserve the input data. You just Direct, connect directly to your enterprise database. Um, in the tools that we provide, the examples that we provide, we're, we're preserving that data, recognizing that not everybody has geodatabase archiving turned on, not everybody has uh, inline history in their database, um, not everybody basically is making their data systems time aware. And, uh, and so the default versions of these tools, they're going to preserve the input data so that you know what went into an analysis, right? So we uh, we supply a name for the uh, for the project, and uh, then we pull in our centerline features. Uh, in this case, we're pulling in routes from a, a Pods Esri spatial geo database. Um, but be very much aware that if you're using uh, APR and UPDM, your continuous network features will work just fine. Uh, we have to have a unique identifier, of course, to keep track of which route we're on, and begin and end measure fields are included. And the idea behind this is, uh, is we're aware that some folks don't even have a linear referencing system for their pipeline systems. And so this tool, as long as you provide begin and end measures, if you don't have measures on the centerline features that you toss in, it's going to go ahead and build them for you. And if you do, well, it'll kick back a warning if your begin and end measures don't actually match the measures on your centerline feature. So it's going to give you some information there. We also need, of course, the most important things here are structures and identified sites. And so what you'll see here is that the tool actually allows you to input more than, uh, than one structure layer. Right, so I've got my structures here in two layers, in, uh, in my structure by whole layer and my identified site by whole layer. So I'm able to specify both. And we're collecting some attribution. And basically, the rule here is that as long as uh, for the required attributes your schema matches, you can have as many layers as you want. So you'll see a unique identifier for the structure. And of course, for, uh, for the purposes of HCA and MCA, it's really the number of units that we want. Now we are collecting number of stories here, and, and this isn't applicable to HCA uh, processing, um, but if you want to use the same data, data set subsequently to do your class location processing, obviously you have to have number of stories, so we're gathering it. This is one of those parameters you might choose to hide. And all of our input and output, of course, is time aware. So we're capturing the, uh, the uh, database state for your structures, as well as the actual field identification date, if you have that. <clears throat> And we do the same thing for identified sites. Uh, the only additional attribution that we're capturing here is the type of identified site. Again, for purposes of analysis, we don't really care. You know, an, a, an identified site causes a HCA period, um, but it is useful for display and a QA, QC down the line. So we capture that information. Now, we also need information that allows us to, uh, to calculate the potential impact circle. And, uh, and to do that, we need to have both diameter and uh, nominal diameter and, and uh, maximum allowable operating pressure information. So we allow you to import uh, pipe segment features of some sort. Uh, obviously, this being a, uh, a pod style database, this is, uh, this is the pipe segment layer. Um, in UPDM, that would be your P pipeline line layer, right, and pulling that in. And once again, we need to know which routes, which features are associated with. So we, we supply a, uh, a, route ID, a route event ID that ties back to our, uh, our, our input centerline features and begin and end measure data. And, and most importantly here for our pipe data, uh, the diameter. I'm using outside diameter here. The, the regulation actually calls for nominal diameter. And uh, so you can use either outside diameter. It'll just give you a, a little bit larger PIR for uh, for smaller diameter pipe. And one of the things to be aware of here is that is that for anything that is on the pipeline center line, you don't actually need features. You know, I'm using a spatial geo database, so I have features, but um, the tool is perfectly happy just to consume tabular data. Um, so if you want to connect this directly to a pods relational event table, knock your lights out, it's, it's perfectly happy with that. Right here we have our, our Mayout features. And again, the one thing that I need here is to get the, uh, the pressure, right? So that's that <clears throat> Mayout field that we're grabbing information from. Now, 
the tool is set up to, uh, to go ahead and use by default the dry gas PIR factor, but you notice it's grammar, you can change it. Um, so if you've got a rich or wet gas system, you wanna bump that to 0.73, you're more than free to do so. Or if you're running products other than natural gas and you have the combustion factors for those guys, um, you can go ahead and insert them as well. You notice that we've got a, uh, a PIR tolerance here, and basically what this is is a fudge factor, so that if you've got some uncertainty in the locations of your structures, the locations of your center line, um, you can add a bit of additional distance to that to allow you to accommodate for that spatial uncertainty. And then we get down to our road inputs, and with respect to our road inputs here, sorry, having a little trouble with my, my sidebar for, for, for go to webinar. Um, with respect to my roadway data, what you'll see here is that I'm hitting a layer in the table of contents um, that is actually corresponding to my to my roads. And I should have pointed this out earlier, but here's my uh, my Texas roadway inventory in this case. Um, we're you know in Houston for this this example, and the symbolization for those. But these are the federal classifications for for symbolizations um, embedded in the data. And what I've got is I've actually got two layers here. I've got I've got all the roadways turned on, and so these are the things you kind of see in light gray in the background. And then I've got just those roads um, that are going to be pertinent to us for MCA analysis. And uh, these are using a little bit darker symbology and are, are shown up this way. And I've just done that with a definition query in the in the table of contents. So um, no particular magic there. Now, if we look at the attribution here within that data set, and recall that diagram uh, from the Texas text.users manual, there's really two attributes that I'm interested in here. Um, the first is median width, right? So for divided roads, I'm going to have a median width that is greater than zero, and, uh, and I'll want to go ahead and capture that. And then the second attribute that I want to take advantage of in this data set is roadbed width, right? And so these two guys, I can add them together. And and that'll give me the, uh, the full paved width edge to edge of my roads. And of course, I specify the units here. The default, as you might expect, is feet, right? If you're, if you're a Canadian, you're going to want to use meters, most likely. And for those of us who are GIS folks, you know, we all understand the Esri buffer tool. What it does is it, is it takes whatever number you feed it, and it buffers um, the same distance on either side of the input polyline feature. And so if we're using our road width data directly, that's going to give us a number that's twice as large as we want. So we have this ability to go ahead and put in a, a division factor. The default is two. Um, so they get proper road width in our, in our road width polygons. Uh, we also allow you to specify a tolerance on your roads, right? So if, uh, again, you've got some uncertainty in the spatial location of your roads, you can go ahead and you can fudge that with an additional tolerance factor. Um, we have two different methods that are available for, for doing your HCA extensions, and, uh, and these are also applicable to determining clustered class, although they work a little bit differently in the background. You know, and if you look at that diagram you looked at a few minutes ago that we looked at with the potential impact circles marching down the, uh, the line, you know, it's readily apparent that really what you should be doing is taking that terminal endpoint and swinging an arc of the radius of your PIR um, to calculate the intersection of that with the center line, and that gives you your extension length, and uh, so that's how we do it. Um, but some people actually go ahead and and, uh, and just uh, extend along from that point in terms of measure distance along the center line, and uh, and so we support both methods. They give you slightly different results. Um, we feel that the arc method is the proper way to do it, so we put that as the default method, but you can change it. And then last but not least, we have our output project geodatabase, and, uh, and so that's where all the results are stored. Now, it takes seven or eight minutes to run this, so I'm not actually going to run it, but what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at the results that were, that were generated. And so what we have here, let me turn it all on, is we have our results for the analysis. And uh, what you can see here is that for the, uh, the HCA range layer, which is turned on, our HCAs are shown in, uh, in, in this kind of bright red, and our MCAs are shown in this kind of orange color. And of course, at this level, we can actually see the PIR around the center line as well. And so what you'll see is, yeah, lo and behold, we do have both HCAs and MCAs. You know, we look up here along the I-10 corridor where we have all of those large buildings, many of which are identified sites and a lot of HCA. And of course, we're right next to the freeway. So as you would expect, it's all MCA as well. 
Um, but things get a little bit more different, uh, interesting down here in the, uh, in the suburban world. So let's go back and take a little bit closer look at that again and, uh, and dive back into that area. Right, and what you'll see as we, as, we, as we dive in and look at things a little bit more closely is that we get some additional information showing up here. Additional layers are turning on in the output. And uh, so what you'll see is you can actually see in this, in this, at this level of resolution, um, you can see all of the um, buffers for all of our input structures. So it's getting pretty dense through here as you might expect. And, uh, and we're showing along the, and of course the line is segmented wherever these guys intersect. So it's very finely segmented at, at this scale. And, uh, and so we're actually looking at our segmented results as just to the uh, gross HCA and MCA range results. And so you see the, uh, the structure counts here running along top and you see the identified site counts running along the, uh, along the bottom. Um, so you've got that additional information. Um, if I go and I click on one of these guys, you know, what you're going to see is you're going to see what we call the provenance of, uh, of that particular feature. <clears throat> so this is what the segmented output for the tool looks like. And what you'll see is we've got the, the BIHO count for that individual segment, uh, the number of uh, identified sites for that individual segment. Um, the provenance is telling us that we've got uh, 5 to 19 structures. And, uh, and um, in this case, uh, we are causing that particular HCA by extension. Um, so it gives you, uh, gives you some uh, uh, additional detailed information for all of that. Now, one of the things that we use this data set for is that we use it for our input into our risk analysis program. So if you think about it, you know, class and even HCA and MCA, they're pretty coarse tools in terms of understanding consequence of failure. And, uh, and, and of course, what we can do here is we've got this segment at the point, we know exactly how many structures um, each portion of the center line affects. And uh, so not, not all HCAs, not all MCAs are equivalent, right? And there are some situations, if I had a larger PIR here, where we'd be far, far over the threshold um, to get a, uh, an HCA. Now you'll notice here, probably some of you notice I've got a number of, uh, of uh, a number showing up here that are considerably less than 20, or a little bit less than 20. Um, but remember that as we work our way along here, all of these guys are, are going to be caused by extension. So wherever I bop over 20, um, that's going to cause an HCA and then everything in between uh, to the extent of the PIR radius is going to, uh, is going to give me an extension. Um, so we've got a lot of that going on. All right. And then one of the things that we are that we are seeing quite commonly when we when we run the tool is that is that just by the nature of the way suburban neighborhoods work, you know, as you as you work your way into an HCA, you'll often see a halo of MCA around it. And so um, that's what we're seeing here as the structure density goes down. Um, we're seeing ourselves slip into uh, to MCA territory. Right. And then as we work our way down the line, this is a, this is a particularly interesting little area, right? So um, what we see is, is this is an area where, hey, we're in MCA territory by virtue of structure count. We've got our extensions up here where we're less than the actual you know, threshold value of five, but we do get our extensions on that. And of course we see those at either end. So we've got that going on in, uh, in both situations here. If we zoom out just a little bit, and scroll on down a bit. Oh, look at this! All right, this is a this is an interesting area here where we have a mix of MCA um, that uh, that is coming to us um, both by virtue of structure counts and then uh, and then solely by virtue of of roads. All right, so um, the little JTT branch here that's my own little special pipeline segment and uh, it's missing some uh, some some uh, pipe segment data. So you notice we didn't actually calculate HCA or MCA on that one. That was one of our Data fault tests, um, but as we work our way around here, you know what you'll see is as we work down the line, you know right here we get to the point where we uh, no longer have enough structures to cause an MCA, um, but lo and behold, we are in the midst of uh, of the PR impact of a road, right? So you can see here in the dark gray um, polyline, that's our input road center line. Um, this this uh, medium gray. Uh, polygon around it, that's our road width polygon. And then we see the PIR polygon around that. And so sure enough, I've got MCA here caused by road. And then out here, I've got my MCA extension and there isn't nothing, right? There's, 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 no, there's no road effect. 
and there's no structures, it's, it's purely MCA by extension. Right, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for uh, for how the tool actually works and what the results look like. Um, you know, if you haven't uh, haven't already been thinking about it, you know, one of the things that should occur to everybody looking at the presentation here is that one of the natural outcomes of this tool is a very finely fine grained analysis of uh, of consequence um, that you can feed into risk. So let's come in back into the slide deck. And uh, let's talk for just a few minutes about the changes that we've made to um, made to uh, class location with respect to class four determination. So one of the uh, one of the interesting things about dealing with the uh, the class location logic as it's presented in the regulatory code is that it's not very concise. And and it, with respect to class four, you know, this operative term here is is prevalent. Right, so anytime I've got uh, a location unit where buildings with four or more stories above ground are prevalent, that's a class four. Well, what the heck does prevalent mean? Well, it turns out that there have been a number of letters of interpretation coming from PIMSA over the years, and, and I've listed uh, the three of the most important ones here. Um, the first one back in 1975 says, hey, go look at the dictionary. That'll tell you all you need to know. Right, um, not particularly helpful from a computer programmer standpoint. The second one here in 18, 1982, it uh, it um, basically says, um, "Hey, one isolated structure does not necessarily constitute a class four. Um, just so everybody's aware, in the default versions of the tool, we do go ahead and, and tag a single isolated four-story structure as a class four. You can change that if you want." Um, but uh, we do treat it that way because I don't want to have to explain to a lawyer that one isolated building isn't prevalent if it's the only building around. And then uh, in, in 07, um, basically, we have a letter of interpretation that has a lot more verbiage. Um, but basically, it, it says in a lot more words what this first one says that, that uh, you want to go look in the dictionary for what prevalent means. So you're basically left as a programmer to come up with something that makes sense. Right now, in this example, what you'll see in the upper upper diagram, I've got my structures highlighted um, by the number of stories. So I've got some nine-story structures. Here's another nine, and then some three stories. So I've I've got a mixture of of uh, of, of tall buildings and not so tall buildings, and yet I'm calling it a class three. In our old tool, we would have called this a class four, most likely, depending on what the uh, what the threshold was set to. Down here, we see a similar situation where I've got a mixture of tall buildings and uh, not so tall buildings, but in this case, I'm calling it a class four. And the question is, well, how do we get to that, right? And so the way we treat it is uh, we go ahead and we march our way down the center line and we identify clusters of buildings that are four stories and higher. And so this kind of pinkish purple polygon is that, is that uh, is that cluster of four-story buildings. And in the old logic, in the old version of the tool, we just simply looked at the count. We gave you the ability to set a threshold count. And uh, if you were above that threshold, you were a class four. Here in the new tool, what we're doing is we're actually comparing within the 660-foot uh, buffer, because that's really our only, our only area of interest, um, the actual count of these four-story and higher buildings relative to the total count of structures within that cluster of four story and higher buildings. And so you see here that I've got seven total um, and uh, and three of them are four story buildings. So um, in, in our default setting, it's 50%. So this guy doesn't actually exceed the threshold to get us to a, a class four. Um, this guy down here on the other hand, it does. So 13 of my 22 um, buildings within this uh, within this class four cluster are four stories above, so it gets us over that 50% threshold. And so that's uh, that's fundamentally how the new tool works. Now, um, let's go ahead and do another quick demo. And of course, Thorlison's been talking too much as usual, so I'm just gonna have to speed it up a bit. All right, so um, just so that uh, so that everybody's confident that we are actually running the, uh, or supporting the tool both in desktop as well as pro, let's go ahead and take a look at it in desktop. Right? And so I'll pop this guy up. Um, so here we are in desktop, and the tools look very much, uh, very much similar. So um, here in my uh, in my catalog window, we can see how the tools present in the uh, desktop world. Here's my Python toolbox tools, and here's the model builder model master tools below that. And of course, in this case, we're going to go ahead and, and and look at class location. 
Now, once again, rather than uh, rather than actually running the tools, let's go ahead and we'll start it from uh, from model history, and uh, and so we'll look at uh, we'll look at class location um, running from an existing result. I'll pop that open just to give you a feel for how the uh, interface for it actually looks. And one of the things that I that I should have done and I didn't do for the last tool is actually introduce you guys to the uh, to the um, Knowledge Center. So all of our tools are set up so that they will actually take you directly, not just to the uh, not just to the item description, which is still available to you, um, but to our new Knowledge Center at knowledgecenter.dqis.com. And what you'll see here is that you get a user experience that is uh, is very familiar. Um, to what Esri would present to you for their tools. So you'll see this navigation pane over here on the left-hand side, and then you'll see summary information, a lot of usage information, and, uh, and then as we scroll down a little bit, you'll actually see um, the syntax section for the tool and how it's called when you're actually running it in, uh, in, in Python scripting code. Um, so a user experience that is very, very similar to what you would see um, in, uh, in, in uh, RGS Pro and RGS Desktop in the Esri Online Help. You notice there's a button to download a free trial. So you can go ahead and download the software there. We'll talk about how that works in a minute. Um, and over here in the Get Started section, if we uh, if we bop over to that, um, what you'll see is that there's information about the uh, of the tool. You know, there's a little introductory article here that's almost all hyperlinks. And then if we go and we look at the uh, at the setup section, what you'll see is the actual uh, download and install instructions for it um, so that you can get walked through actually installing the software. But if we take it back to the tool, what you'll see is a setup that looks very, very much like the setup for um, the GAS HCA MCA method two tool. We're gonna create a project database. I need my input center lines. I need my structures, right? In this case, I really do need to know the number of stories. Um, I need my um, identified sites or qualifying areas and outside buildings. We encourage you to use your identified sites as your qualifying areas and outside buildings for class location analysis. And again, the same type of, uh, of input data there. You notice we've exposed the buffered instances for both, uh, for both qualifying areas and buildings and um, uh, bios. Um, 99% of you are going to choose to hide those because you don't really want to change them as well as the sliding mile length. One of the things that we do for class that we uh, um, that's not really applicable to HCAs is um, we allow you to on output for display purposes and for planning patrol ranges and things like that. If you want to go ahead and take a narrow footage of lesser class and dissolve it into um, surrounding class locations that are higher. Well, you can do that. In this version of the tool, we're set up so that uh, so that you know we're not doing that. We're just letting the chips fall where they may. And uh, again, you know, it takes seven or eight minutes to run this. Let me close this up, and we'll just go look at the results. All right. So the results here are are not dissimilar to uh, to what you would see for the Gas HCA tools. You'll see, you know, at, when you're zoomed out, you'll see the higher level class location ranges. This is what you'd use for reporting in most purposes. Um, but we've also got the uh, we've also got the segmented output, and I've got both clustered and, cl and clustered class location here. Um, we don't really have time to go into clustering, so uh, so we'll we'll skip that. But let's uh, let's go ahead and, and drop down into our suburban area once again, and and this is uh, this is kind of an interesting example down here. All right. So when we get zoomed into this, once again, what we're seeing along the top are our structure counts or bio counts. In this case, it's sliding mile counts. So of course, they're much higher. Right, as well as our identified site counts. And, and here's an interesting, uh, and of course we have provenance uh, values on all of these as well, but here's an interesting example of something that in our old software, if we were using say a threshold of, of two for four story buildings, this would have been a class four. Um, but now, you know, we're comparing the, uh, the count of, of our few four story buildings um, to, uh, to all of the structures in here. And of course there's a ton of single family residences. And so this thing no longer qualifies as a class four using the uh, using the new logic. Um, so we think that's a little bit more robust, right? And uh, we're we're running out of time. So rather than diving more uh, closely into results, let's uh, let's jump back into the slides for a few minutes and uh, and say just a few more words about how how the software is set up and, and how it works. All right. So let me uh, let me go back into 
presentation mode here. So let's talk a little bit about licensing. Uh, we are using a new software licensing technology um, that's provided by a company called Evo Leap based here in Houston. And, uh, and basically it's token based. And so those of you who are existing users of the tool, you'll just receive a new license code, right? Um, all of the licenses are named user-based, uh, which is very much the direction that Esri is going, of course, with their software. And, uh, and uh, the way that the, we set it up is that, you know, many of you are running multi-tier deployment environments. Some of you have a machine at work and machine at home. So, you know, just because you're a named user, it doesn't mean you're node locked. You can install on multiple machines. And the big thing about this for us is that, is that it allows us not to support only the traditional, you know, perpetual use license, but now we can go ahead and we can, uh, we can support subscription licenses. And of course, trial licenses are just kind of a form of temporary subscription for free, if you will. Um, so we can very easily support trial licenses as well. Um, the neat thing about the subscription license is that allows you to get into the software for a significantly lower cost than if you were paying full boat perpetual licensing. Um, so it reduced costs for those of you who are who are are sensitive to that kind of thing. And the neat thing from it uh, for, from a user standpoint is that once you get your license key, you know if you choose to convert to a, to an actual paid license, you don't have to reinstall anything or even get a new. Um, license key. We do all that at our end, and it and it just uh, and it just um, um, converts for you. Now, um, obviously, this uh, you know when you run the software, the, the little background process runs, and and uh, and the licensing software phones home to make sure that you have a valid token. And so, much like the uh, the Esri technology, it allows you to go ahead and use your software offline um, if you uh, can't actually get to the, the licensing server. And um, Esri, of course, you know, you go and you check out a license typically to do that. Um, we opted not to do that. We, uh, we simply allow you to run offline. You can run for X number of days before you'll get any kind of a, of a squawk. Um, so that's all very much transparent to you. So we're kind of excited about this. And, you know, we hopefully it's going to enable people to, uh, to go ahead and experience the software um, without actually having to buy it first, um, which, is a, which is a good thing. Whoops. Excuse me there, bopped out of uh, bopped out of, of display mode. Um, so let's go ahead and just wrap it up uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what we've talked about this morning. So the first thing and, and the important thing is is that the new tool um, fully supports MCA determination. So um, uh, you guys, for those of you who are existing users, you'll be able to meet that requirement very easily before the uh, July first deadline. And uh, and we've also gone ahead and we've made um, some some changes to the way we determine prevalence for class four. Um, we think it's uh, we think it's more realistic. You know, our old way of doing it was very very conservative, and uh, and so this may reduce class four mileage in some cases. Of course, you can set that percentage to whatever you want. So you know, if you want to keep it very very conservative, you can very easily do that. Um, once again, you know, we're, we're really aiming all of our development efforts here at G2 really towards ArcGIS Pro and, uh, and the APR platform and subsequently the utility network platform. Um, so that's our primary focus. Um, the GAS HCA tool, because it's been out there for so long, you know, we are, we are going to continue to support desktop for the foreseeable future. Um, and, uh, and so for those of you who are on desktop, no worries, you know, just because we're telling you to use Pro, you don't have to, you can use desktop. Although I will say once again, there are things that you can do in pro with geoprocessing that you can't easily do in desktop. And uh, everybody who is using desktop has pro available to them. Um, so you might actually consider using the GAS HCA tool as a way to get into ArcGIS Pro, even though you're still using desktop for a lot of your day-to-day -day work. Uh, the new tool supports all of the uh, all the major pipeline data models, um, including no data model at all for those of you who, uh, who who don't don't actually have a pipeline data model. Right, the tool will work with uh, with with polylines and, and actually create linear referencing on the fly. Um, but it uh, it works with pods relational, works with pod spatial, works with the APDM, uh, works with the UPDM, and any flavor that you might care to implement on top of that that uses the uh, location referencing information model. Um, so, so very, very flexible from that uh, from that standpoint. We didn't really get a lot of time to spend there, but uh, but the new version of the tool on both desktop and pro is fully integrated with the new knowledge center. So, I encourage everybody to go out and take a look at that. 
And, uh, and finally, you know, this is a, a very significant change for us, really. You know, in the past, we only supported perpetual licenses at either the enterprise or the user level. Um, but now we're capable of supporting subscription licenses and we're capable of, uh, of supporting, easily supporting trials. Um, so you'll see this tool showing up in fairly short order on the, uh, on the marketplace. And, uh, and of course, you can download it from our website. Um, we have additional new tools that are coming out that you'll be able to actually download directly through Conda in ArcGIS Pro and put it directly into your Python environment. Um, so cool new stuff coming for you. And with that, uh, we've got uh, five minutes left for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, <clears throat> and wrap it up and um, go ahead and open the question panel. And let's see what kind of questions that we've got out here. Sure. Well, first, I wanted to give a shout out to you and your team. I, I'm pretty sure most of them are probably listening to you this morning on the job well done with the new tool. And we do have a couple questions. They're quick ones, it looks like. It says, in your slide with the school and PIR, does the school footprint mean the boundary of the property or of the buildings? So that depends very much on how you choose to interpret it, right? Um, uh, you know, we're not telling you how to define your, your identified sites. Um, a lot of folks will go ahead and uh, and actually take the full the full um, boundaries of the school um, with the recognition of the fact that you've got playgrounds and sports fields and things like that and uh, that are occupied uh, meet the occupancy requirements for a uh, for a type A identified site. So you know again understand that that little picture that we were looking at that's straight from uh, that's straight from the from the uh, um, code of federal regulations so i was just using that as a as an illustration example but yeah but in most cases you're going to want to capture those outside areas that uh, that correspond to a type a identified site okay it says do you have a version for canadian operators with csa code so that's a that's a that's a very good question and and uh hopefully you know one of the things that you noticed is that in that in that tool is that it's very highly configurable with those lower level tools. So, you know, no, at this point, we haven't exposed a model builder, model master tool that will, that will support uh, CSA code, but we do believe that the, the underlying tools themselves will support it. And so, uh, so, so a Canadian person who asked that question, we'd be happy to talk to you in further detail um, with, respect to, with respect to that particular um, need. All right, um, any other questions show up there, Marissa? I got one more. It says, when do you apply 30% SMYS criteria per pipe segment or for the whole pipeline if you have varying SMYS along the line? Okay, so pipe smites, that's uh, that's that's specified minimum. <laughs> if you say so. so. <laughs> yeah, so um, no, so we uh, we actually we actually apply that at the uh, at the pipe segment level. And uh, those those uh, that those parameters, both both um, SMICE and uh, and material, are exposed in the tools. They're not exposed in the master tool, so I didn't show them to you. Um, but of course, they're they're important for for regulatory determinations. Also important for doing regulated gathering. Um, so you notice that uh, from those of you who use the old tool, you know we had support for regulated gathering, and we will of course in the new tool as well. Um, we didn't expose it here um, because we wanted to make sure we were had everybody good to go for uh, um, for uh, MCA. Um, but the regulated gathering will be showing back up and and, and showing up in there. So um, the answer is, is 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 it's at the uh, at the pipe segment level. It's at the it's at the individual length of pipe level, and that actually applies to your uh, to your uh, PIR determinations as well. So if you have a change in diameter within a line or a change in MAOP within a line within a route um, that'll actually uh, affect you at that level too. So it's, it's finally segmented. Okay. Um, any other questions? That is all we've got. We hope you all enjoy okay. the present. Oh, go ahead. No, I was, gonna, I was gonna do what you're doing. So go right ahead. Uh, yeah. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'll follow up with you guys with a copy of the presentation as well as a link to the recording. So make sure you be on the lookout for that as well as information on our future webinars. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you back next week for uh, Wally Magahi, G2's Director of Regulatory Compliance, and his gastrol update. Thanks for joining. Yep, and stay safe and stay healthy, everybody. Bye.